which will be about our beloved colleague Michel Serre that we know passed away this uh, past year, 2019. And um, we had a memorial for him this fall. And the, you know, remembrance, the collection keeps going. And um, I had been contacted by our guest speaker sometime in the last six months, I think, saying that um, he was finishing the first real book, uh, Michel Serre's Philosophy Seen as a Whole, and that he was going to be in the Bay Area and be interested in uh, hearing him speak about this. And I said, of course, I mean, there's not, uh, the French and Italian Department of Stanford is not going to turn down that. So we're very happy that Christopher Watkin has come all the way from Australia, not only for this talk, but <laughs> yes. other things that he has going on here in the Bay Area. He's a senior lecturer uh, in French at Monash University in Melbourne, and his self-described um, vocation as an intellectual is to uh, seek to make sense of how people make sense of the world and how they interact with ideas and positions different from their own. So that is certainly interesting, especially for those of us who are attracted to Hannah Arendt and her concept of the enlarged mentality, where you see things from someone else's point of view. His first book, it, he, he's published a lot of books. I'm really quite astonished at, at, uh, for a young scholar how, how much he's actually has out there in print. But his first book is Phenomenology or Deconstruction, question mark, 2009. Uh, which explores the relationship between um, two major philosophical tendencies and the thought of Maurice uh, Medlo-Ponty, Paul Ricoeur, Jean-Luc Nancy. <coughs> That's followed by Difficult Atheism in 2011. That examines three other contemporary thinkers, Alain Badieu, Badieu Nancy, and Quentin Meillassou, uh, to make sense of the world how they make sense of the world without the gods of metaphysics, poetry, and religion, and how their three positions critique and refine each other. And subsequent to that, another book called French Philosophy Today, New Figures of the Human in Badiou, Meyassou, Malabou, Serre, and Bruno Latour, uh, which is interesting. I won't mention other uh, monographs on Foucault, Derrida, and one forthcoming on Deleuze, and there's other uh, titles that I could mention. The, the important thing for us today is that he has a forthcoming book with Edinburgh Press on Michel Serre, Figures of Thought, and um, this continues his investigation into the ways of making sense of the world uh, by presenting the first systematic treatment in English of a key 20th and 21st century philosopher whose genuinely cross-disciplinary work finds complex northwest passages between the science, humanities, and arts. And the northwest passages is an allusion to the title. Uh, I think it's one of the Hermes volumes, is it? Fifth volume. Fifth volume of, of the Head Mess, that five-volume Hermes volume, that uh, uh, book that Michel published in the 80s, I think early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. And the northwest passage is this beautiful metaphor for how you find a narrow opening in between two different domains. And I think, as we'll hear today um, from Christopher Watkin, that Michel said is really the thinker who finds uh, passages between these different domains of knowledge. So welcome to Stanford. We're delighted to receive you here. So looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much, Robert. I Thank you, and, and th just thank you for the wonderfully warm reception that I've received here. Um, thank you, Robert, thank you, Vittorio, and others that have just made me feel really, really welcome so far. Yeah, we, took, we took him into KCSU, <laughs> kind of whisked him in there, and recorded a show just right before this talk. Yeah, that was wonderful fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was thinking that I would sit, but I, I, if I do so, I, I can't see everyone, so I might stand if that's okay. I hope it's not too sort of imposing. Um, I, I'm very, very encouraged, but not in the least surprised to see the number of people here, given the topic of uh, the talk this evening. 
um, I've just been able to pick up one or two little crumbs of Cesiana while I've been here at Stanford and it seems that he really did leave a very profound impression uh, on everyone he met here and I really feel privileged to be able to to hear from some of you uh, your own experiences of, of Michel Serre uh, and just what a electrifying uh, personality uh, he was. My aim this evening uh, is by no means to do justice to that but if, if you like in a way to, to gesture feebly towards uh, what I think is some of the, the exciting uh, necessary work uh, that Michel Serre has done and ways that we might want to appropriate that uh, today. I do, however, feel that the trope of the Cersean parasite uh, is apposite to this talk. I, I, I feel that I'm very much not the uninvited but the unexpected guest mm -hmm. among many who knew Michel Serre well and some uh, who could count him indeed as, as their close friends. Um, I never met Serre uh, during his lifetime. It's one of the regrets uh, that I have uh, on writing the book. Um, and so I, I feel strange to be standing up here speaking to people who did know him, who were his friends. Um, uh, and I'd love to hear from you guys in the discussion time afterwards, uh, things that you want to add uh, or enrich uh, what I have to say with. So then why am I here? I feel as though I owe you an explanation. Um, I first came across Michel Serre when I was writing the book that Robert referred to, New Figures of the Human. I was trying to look at how contemporary French philosophers think of human beings. What are we? And I found that a common thread was that we, you and I, were viewed in terms of our capacities. We were, you know, the rational animal, the, the language animal. And the more I thought about that, the more problematic I found that position in relation, for example, to those who don't or can't, for whatever reason, speak uh, for very young children, the, the very old people. Um, and it seemed to me that, that defining us in terms of our categories was really quite, uh, in terms of our capacities, was really quite inadequate. So I was looking around for French thinkers who didn't do that. Uh, and that's when I stumbled across Michel Serre for the first time, and his grand récit de l'univers, his great story of the universe, uh, which he tells right from the Big Bang uh, up to the present, as a series of, of bifurcations. He has the, the image of a branch. This story is always branching, always changing. And he situates us in that story, uh, in a way that doesn't, in the first instance, rely on our capacities. Uh, and so I, I brought him as a, a counterpoint uh, to that capacity view of humanity into the book. But that raises a question, why then did I decide to write my next book on the single author, Michel Say? It's not something I've done before. I've never, uh, apart from those little uh, books that, that Robert was talking about, never written a, a, an academic monograph on a single author. I, I have no intention of doing so again. So what, what is it about Serre, speaking personally, that made this the book uh, that I want to write? Well, I feel a little bit like an artist asked to explain her work, you know, just standing, look at it, it's there, it speaks for itself, look at him. Yeah, how could you not be drawn to such a man? But nevertheless, I will try to put words to what it was that, that made Sir irresistible for me. Um, it was certainly the grandness of his vision, uh, mixed with a sense that I've rarely experienced in reading a philosopher, that he or she is saying something genuinely unique, uh, that I hadn't read anywhere else, uh, and that he was saying it in a unique way as well. I have to say that I was also beguiled by his lack of philosophical pomposity, uh, the lack of a philosophical brand. There's no Cersean deconstruction. Uh, there's no Cersean archaeology. There's no Cersean transcendental empiricism. Thank goodness. Uh, and I also loved how he published with uh, Le Pommier, um, a, a lesser known publishing house compared to the, the big monoliths in French culture. Uh, not with one of those dominant academic presses that our institutions perpetually hound us to scramble into if we're academics. I admired how he, he strove to communicate his thought to the widest audience possible, uh, producing at least two multi um, episode TV documentary series, 
uh, appearing on the fabled Apostrophe um, talk show in France, which any intellectual in the 70s, 80s and 90s who was anybody appeared on Apostrophe. It was the one gatehouse to sort of national intellectual stardom. Well, he was on there a number of times. Uh, and how he appeared regularly on his five-minute Sunday uh, radio broadcast, Le Sens de l'Info, The Meaning of the News, where he'd take a story in the news from that week and just talk about it with his co-host Michel Polacco uh, for five minutes every Sunday uh, for decades. And, I confess, I liked the fact that he smiled, which is not a given in recent French philosophers um, <laughs> by any means. And so, I embarked on the quest of writing a book on Serre. Uh, against my better judgment when I saw the length of his bibliography, 60 plus monographs, what was I thinking? And against the advice of other Serre scholars, actually, who maintained in print that any such undertaking was utterly misguided. And if it proved one thing, it proved that the person trying to write a book on Serre didn't understand Michel Serre at all. Nevertheless, I wanted to, I felt the lack of anyone having, so to speak, and in quotation, scare quotes, having done Serre properly in English. Uh, there were collections of essays, fine essays, great essays, but no one had really tried to take a look at his thought as a whole, particularly beginning with his um, great early work, great both in extent uh, and in depth, uh, the system of Leibniz, all 800 pages of it, uh, which I think really does form the basis um, with modulations for everything that comes afterwards. No one had really engaged at great length with that. Uh, I wanted to start with that, run through the, the Hermes series that, that Robert was talking about, uh, the Foundation series, uh, the interviews, the broadcast. I wanted to try and bring it all together, uh, distill some of its main, and I hope, and I'm increasingly convinced, timely uh, interventions and, and present them to, to an audience that may not necessarily be desperate to read the next French philosopher to, to, to sort of write as, as widely as I could. And so what I intend to offer you uh, today is really just the, the barest skeleton, uh, perhaps in truth only a handful of vertebrae, uh, of my take on Serre. Uh, although, as he's fond of reminding us, there are multiple ways through each one of his books and therefore how much more multiple ways through his work as a whole. I'm not claiming that this is the one way uh, one must take. Although I don't think what I'm going to say is idiosyncratic, I think it cuts with the grain of Serre's own thinking and it indeed picks up on some hints in his own work about how he reads himself and how he would like to be read. So anyway, here it is. I'd like to explore Serre, not in terms of what he thinks about any particular subject, but about how he thinks about everything. Uh, I'd like to show that his thought has a, a distinct character and a distinct power, I think, that stands alongside contemporaries of his, such as uh, Derrida. Uh, uh, they were at the uh, ENS in France, uh, in Paris at the same time together. They went on a skiing holiday together. It's where Derrida met his uh, future wife, uh, Marguerite, um, uh, to set him alongside uh, Deleuze and Foucault and other authors. And to, to, to offer some reflections also given that I'm doing this, on the very idea of trying to characterise the thought of a philosopher. What is at stake in that very gesture, never mind what we think about Serre. So then, Michel Serre published consistently, indefatigably, uh, from the late 1960s until his death uh, in the middle of last year. Uh, he authored uh, 60 or so monographs on subjects of contemporary importance ranging from the future of humanity, uh, to the nature of social relations and ecology, uh, including three French bestsellers, so he wasn't simply a philosopher's philosopher by any means. Uh, and there were reportedly, I think I heard, four posthumous works in var of various levels of completion uh, yet to be published, one of which Robert informed me earlier today has now uh, been published. So he wrote a lot. And if we want to understand him uh, and how he thinks, I think we do need to go back to this uh, magnum opus, Le Système de Leibniz, is modèle mathématique. It weighs in at 800 pages. Uh, it's around 300,000 words, which makes it substantially longer than Derrida's of grammatology, which is uh, 230,000, if you were wondering. 
uh, and fractionally longer than Deleuze and Guattari's 1,000 plateaus, which is 290,000. It appeared in 1968, a year in which very little else happened, as far as I can tell. Um, and uh, it uh, came out, therefore, in the same year as uh, Roland Barthes' uh, essay, The Death of the Author, um, one year after Derrida's Of Grammatology uh, and Deleuze's Difference and Repetition, and two years after uh, Foucault's The Order of Things. Uh, so indeed, bliss was it in that very dawn to be alive, uh, but to be young uh, was very heaven. My goodness, what a, what a period of intellectual production uh, over those couple of years in Paris at the time. Well, in this book, we see the birth of a series of characteristic, what I'm going to call Cezian moves or Cezian patterns that distinguish his work and set him apart from those other uh, philosophers that I've mentioned. Ser himself calls these gestures figures of thought, um, but they're, it's, they're more than generic tendencies or characteristics. He, he, he means, the, the, the word is thicker than that when he uses it. Uh, in their form, as well as in their content, these figures are very particular to Ser, uh, and I think they're a distinctive uh, characteristic of his thought, both in terms of what he thinks and how he thinks about what he thinks. Um, there are three key characteristics of these figures. The first is that they are algorithmic operators, uh, complex functions for producing an infinite variety of outputs from an infinite possibility of inputs. In other words, they're not a, a what, they're a how. Um, they're ways of thinking that can operate on any number of different objects. It's, it's not an object in itself. It's, it's a, an, a, a, an operation that's performed upon something. That's, that's the first thing that's meant by a figure. Secondly, these figures of thought are natural phenomena for Serre, not, not merely cultural artefacts. So, for example, Serre will say, and does say in Le Gauche Boiteur, that species of flora and fauna are figures. Uh, understood as new inventions, new branchings in the great story of the universe. And whatsoever figures may exist, in whatever form they exist, uh, they all emerge, and this is a, a quoting said directly, they all emerge from the movement of the universe, of life, of the body, of cultures, in short, of thought. So there is then a fundamental continuity in Serre between the way he understands the, the rhythms and patterns of nature and the way that he understands the rhythms and patterns of thought, that, that there is no breach in that continuity. Thirdly, figures are also found in literature for Serre. Um, so he has many examples of Hermes being one, Ulysses, Don Quixote, Harlequin, Pierrot, the Grand Inquisitor, uh, and on and on in his works. And, and for Serre, these are figures just as much as the daisy in one's garden is a figure. Uh, just as much as the Fosbury flop, uh, a way of uh, holding the body, uh, a figure, a corporeal figure, is a figure. Just as much as the pas de deux or any other dance is a figure. For say, He's using the same word to describe all of these phenomena that we would usually think of as quite disparate from each other. And in, in each case, what distinguishes these figures is that they draw together the general and the individual without there being any... Um, tension between those two for Serre. But these literary figures, um, uh, and this I think distinguishes him from other uh, contemporary thinkers, these literary figures are upstream for Serre of any concepts that we might want to derive from them. Um, for the very good reason that they perform and incorporate ideas rather than just describing them. So, for example, a beautiful man or a beautiful woman is beautiful in the way that the concept of beauty is not beautiful. Uh, and it's, it's this, this participation in the idea, I think, that draws Serre in part uh, to privileging these figures above abstract concepts. He still deals in abstract concepts, but they're always derivative. They're always downstream, reductive of these figures. And so taking points two and three together then, says twin insistence on the natural origin of all figures of thought and on their literary or fleshly incarnation, either way, sets them apart from other attempts, I think, to label philosophical moves 
Uh, we might think, for example, of the philosophemes evoked by uh, Derrida and Badiou and others. Or we might think of um, uh, Deleuze and Guattari's conceptual personae uh, in what is philosophy. Um, I'm just going to spend a moment distinguishing Serge figures from conceptual personae because I think that that's the closest that, that anyone else gets to him. Um, so Deleuze and Gattari, in what a philosophy, what is philosophy, uh, have a series of personae. For example, we've got the friend, the enemy, uh, the foreigner, the stranger, the deportee, the revolutionary people. And, and these conceptual personae for Deleuze and Gattari are in the service of concepts. Uh, they say, this is a direct quote, they carry out the movements that describe the author's plane of imminence. Uh, and they play a part in the very creation of the author's concepts. So they play a part in the creation of concepts. They serve the creation of concepts. Now, it's clear that Serre admires Deleuze and Gattari's uh, conceptual persona. I, I don't want to suggest that there's some sort of feud between them. Uh, but his figures, or what elsewhere he calls his character concepts, are significantly different to this. So whereas for Deleuze and Gattari, the conceptual persona serves the creation of concepts, as they themselves say. For Serre, the concept is always a distillation of the figure, always derivative of the character that gives it life. Uh, so Serre, for Serre, the character is the origin and the end of the concept. Uh, the concept is a way station uh, and not uh, the, the sort of the, the whole ball game. Uh, the character comes first. And the concept always rides in on its coattails afterwards for Serre. Uh, when he's asked directly whether his character concepts are like Deleuze's conceptual personae, uh, in other words, heteronyms of Michel Serre, uh, this is the way he answers. And I thought this was quite a, quite a bolshy moment from Serre. He says, no, in no way. It is, in fact, quite the opposite. If it were me, it wouldn't be interesting. What Deleuze defines, basically, is the equivalence between a character and a novel. Madame Bovary is me, Flaubert said. Now, in my case, the characters are true incarnations, and this is that stress on, on enfleshment, on corporeality that he maintains. Hermes, for example, is the man, singular, of the new age, global, bringing, bringing the, the local and the global together without tension. Uh, when the paradigm of communication replaces the paradigm of production, he succeeds Prometheus. So then these Cersean figures, and th this is sort of my main takeaway point from this section, I think, of the talk. These Cersean figures are unique and they're uniquely potent in the landscape of recent European thought. What I'd like to do now is um, to give a sense of the, the distinctiveness of Cersean figures by, by picking up on a couple of them and just talking about them uh, relatively briefly. Um, patterns of his thought that recur throughout different works. And, and what I try and do in the book, and what I'm going to try and do here, is group these individual figures in categories, or if you like, group the species of figures in, in genera, um, to say what, 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 does, what do says figures have in common? That means that we can talk, for example, about a certain group of them together. And again, this is not something that Sen ever did himself. He, he offers a couple of moments in his work where he does this. So I don't feel as though I'm betraying him by trying to do this. The, the first one that I want to talk about is one that, that in the Leibniz book, he labels umbilical thinking. Um, it's always useful, isn't it, for a philosopher, and it's always useful for us in understanding a philosopher to know what it is they pit themselves against. What is the antagonist? How do we label or name what it is they don't like? You know, so for, for the Derrida of grammatology, it's logocentrism, uh, for example. For Heidegger, it's the forgetting of being. Um, or for the Deleuze of difference and repetition, it's the dogmatic image of thought. W what is the other position that they are defining themselves against? Because, as in life with individuals, as with philosophers, one can tell a lot about a person by what it is they define themselves in contradistinction to. And for Serre, this, I think, is, is best captured by this term umbilical uh, thinking. Uh, in anatomy, of course, the umbilicus is the, the navel, the fixed central point through which the, the nourishment passes to the fetus. Uh, in geometry, 
it's a now obsolete term describing a, a focus, the point uh, on a surface through which all lines of curvature pass. And in Le, Le Système de Leibniz, Serre condemns what he calls umbilical disciplines or umbilical discourses, uh, by which he means discourses that claim to speak the zero degree of truth, uh, in relation to which all other discourses are metaphorical abstractions. So, so this way of speaking gives you the real truth about things, uh, and other ways of speaking uh, are, are metaphorical or embroidered in relation to it. Uh, so for example, it's, it's the sort of position um, relatively, I think, and disturbingly prevalent today, still, that says, you know, at bottom, everything is economic. If you want to understand something, you've got to go to it. You can, you can read other stuff as well, that's fine. If you really want to understand how things properly work, it's got to be economics. Or you can do the same with biology, you can do the same with mathematics, you're doing the same with psychoanalysis, it doesn't matter what it is. But it's this idea of there is one discourse that gets to the heart of how things really are, and everything else you can take or leave. Um, Say uses the example uh, of uh, linguistic structuralism. Uh, he calls this uh, umbilical because it assumes the linguistic model with its groups and its transformations, its phonemes and its oppositional couples uh, as an adequate way for describing systems of relations that themselves aren't linguistic. It universalizes the model of language, use it to talk about everything as if linguistics was all one needed. Uh, he says that the Copernican revolution is umbilical in this same way. Uh, it assumes that the sun is an absolute fixed point. It works quite well for the solar system, but it's hopeless once one goes outside the solar system. Uh, he also calls the Cartesian cogito umbilical, uh, insofar as it extracts the thinking thing, rationality, from the, from the harlequin-like patchwork of what it means to be a human being, uh, and erects it as his language is the one ticket office through which all true knowledge must pass. That's umbilical. And in fact, for Sir, modernity itself is characteristically and irreducibly umbilical. Uh, it's obsessed with the search for the one fixed point in terms of which we can make sense of the whole. And Sir's umbilicism, uh, along with Derrida's logocentrism and uh, Deleuze's dogmatic image of thought, it is a narrowing. It's a reduction of a complex state of affairs into one of its components, as if that component could yield for us an adequate view of the whole. But where I think Serre's focus differs from that of Derrida and Deleuze is in the virulence with which he rejects the idea of any queen discourse, as he calls it, any one dominant way of speaking and writing uh, that, contr that controls the plurality of discourses. Um, and Robert and I were discussing this earlier today, the idea that philosophy can only be written in one way uh, and that to accuse a philosopher of being poetic is an insult and a shame upon them. It's, it's, it's that idea. There is one way of speaking that yields the absolute truth of things. You can embroider poetry on top of that if you like, um, but that's a take it or leave it position. There is a zero degree way of speaking that is the way of delivering truth. Um, and while Deleuze Mutatis Mutandis is happy to write in a predominantly philosophical register, uh, while uh, Derrida does the same with some notable exceptions like the double session. Serre is, do you have rock in America? The, 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 there's a word down the middle of a, a long stick of rock and wherever you cut it, it's the same word? Okay, there's a confectionery <laughs> in, in the UK that's sort of rolled, it's, it's, it's a sticky um, a stick. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> never go off script, of confectionery. And the thing about it is that you can, you can write a word in it, like you, you write Brighton or Blackpool, and wherever you cut this cylindrical stick of rock, it's the same word in the middle. So anyway, Sir is like a stick of rock, in the sense that wherever you cut his writing, he's speaking, as he himself says, in multiple voices. There isn't a privilege of this zero degree philosophical register in Sir. He is systematically pluralizing the ways in which he speaks in his work in a way that, that does, I think, set him apart from other thinkers like Derrida uh, and Deleuze. So then, that's what Sir sets himself, sets himself against, umbilicism. Uh, I want to just speak about one of uh, the figures um, that, that I think is characteristic of, of his thought. 
Um, it, he does call it this at one point in the Leibniz book, but, but I've used it to talk about his thought as a whole. Opposition by multiplication. Let, let's come at it through what, what Sir does with Plato, uh, which will give us a, a lovely way of comparing Sir uh, to other uh, thinkers, because every 20th century French thinker worth her or his salt does something with Plato, uh, and it can give us a nice uh, way to read across different thinkers. So, Deleuze overturns Platonism by elevating the simulacrum to the controlling role in the construction of truth. Uh, Derrida disrupts the Platonic sun, if you think of the, the cave allegory uh, in the Republic, the, the prisoner who, who leaves the chains of the cave and the shadows to, to go and contemplate the sun directly. Uh, Derrida deconstructs the Platonic sun uh, 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 and its claim to absolute presence, but Serre does something really quite different. He opposes Platonic truth by multiplying it. Um, and I think we can most readily understand what he's doing here uh, by looking at his rewriting of Plato's cave allegory. He, he doesn't broadcast it as such, but, but I think there's a moment in his writing that is very clearly a rewiring of Plato's cave. Now, I just want to walk through that and, and what he does with that idea. As a prolegomenon to that, um, I think it's, it's worth seeing how he gets from the idea of one son to a plurality. So, at its simplest, Serre's response to Plato is to multiply the single sun in the Platonic sky into plural sources of knowledge. Uh, and he begins by rethinking Copernican cosmology. Um, this is one of the many areas in which writing about Serre I felt completely out of my depth. But the thing about Serre is that he, he puts anyone out of their comfort zone. He, he was so um, uh, sort of broadly learned um, that no matter who we are, uh, we are going to find ourselves uncomfortable uh, at what we've got to try and get up to speed on in relation to Sir. And this was certainly one of my moments as someone who doesn't have a scientific training. So Copernicus placed the sun at the uh, centre of the solar system, but uh, Sir tells us that Kepler's laws of planetary motion state that the elliptical orbits of heavenly bodies don't actually have one centre, but two effective centers throughout, uh, around which they turn. Uh, the first almost exactly coincides with the location of the sun, but there's also, says Serre, a second focus of which no one ever speaks, as efficacious and necessary as the first, uh, a sort of second black sun indicated here by F1 uh, and F2. So what Serre's done in, in this move is he's gone beyond the idea that there, that we can think in terms of there being one center, cosmologically, uh, to the necessity of two in, in order to understand how, how orbits happen. And then he multiplies this duality uh, in Le Gauche et Boite, and he, he ends up with, with a multiplicity of truths, and this is how he does it. He gives the, the multiplication of suns its own cave allegory. This is another wonderful feature of Serre's writing, isn't it? He, he, he works, weaves himself in and out of narratives and images in, in a way that don't simply illustrate what he's saying, but that embody what he's saying. I think this is one of the wonderful moments where he does that. He refers to one of his beloved authors, uh, Jules Verne, and the, uh, the novel A Vanished Diamond, in which Verne uh, describes an underground bejeweled cave into which the, uh, the, the heroes, the protagonists of the novel, uh, descend and, and light their lamps. And there's a, a beautiful rainbow-like reflection and refraction of the light from their lamps in all the different crystals uh, that are um, encircling the cave. Uh, and this over on the left here is uh, Plato's allegory, uh, where the, uh, the enchained prisoner breaks free of the chains and ascends to the sun outside. I think there are five ways in which Serre is subverting this platonic idea of truth in his cavernous idea of truth. Number one, Plato's captive has to leave the cave in order to find the light. But Verne invites us to enter the cave. It's within the cave that the truth is found. Secondly, Plato has one central dominant sun driving away all the shadows. But Verne, if you like, has one central shadow and thousands of glittering little lights. Thirdly, 
For Plato, there's one single isolated captive who ascends to the sun, uh, one and one alone. Uh, but Verne has a plurality of voyagers who experience the cave. Uh, and their lights multiply the effect of the reflections um, and pl therefore pluralize the subject of truth. It's not the lone seeker after truth in Verne's allegory for Serre. Uh, there's a plurality uh, of people in there. Number four, Plato's son is transcendent. It's inhuman. It's overpowering. Uh, but the torches that light Verne's cave are manufactured normal, human, really quite unremarkable. Uh, and in this, I think, Sir is de-dramatizing and rewriting, really quite cheekily and on the fly, Nietzsche's parable of the madman from the gay science. You remember, I seek God, I seek God. We've killed him, all of us, that moment. Because in Sir's Vernian cave, um, uh, the lamp does actually bring light. And so, to sort of misquote Camus, in Verne's cave, we must imagine Nietzsche's madman happy, I think. Number five, Plato's captive uh, has the good fortune uh, and the impeccable timing to exit the cave precisely at the hour of noon, uh, when there are no shadows cast anywhere uh, and the sun's light uh, is not adulterated in that way. Uh, but Verne's light, by contrast, is described in terms of, of Sir puts it this way, the chaotic and fluid twinkling of possible glimmers. Uh, which open a thousand and one ways. It's a light that's always intermixed with shadow. And for Serre, that is necessary for the production of truth. Uh, he contrasts elsewhere Plato to, to Thales. Remember, Thales measured the height of a pyramid by using its shadow. So it's a combination of sun and shadow that yield knowledge for Serre, not the blinding iridescence of the sun casting out any shadow. All that does, he says, is blind you. It doesn't give you any knowledge. So then, Serre's cave allegory is one of a truth which is multiple, it's complementary, it's secular, it's qualified. And he opposes Platonic truth, not by overturning or deconstructing Platonism, but by multiplying the effect of the Platonic sun. Now, this opposition by multiplication and a, a number of other figures that, that, that I discuss in the book, characteristic of Serre's thought, are not isolated moments that we have to consider individually uh, when we read him. Um, they do cohere, and they cohere into what Sir himself calls a global intuition. He also calls it um, a new way of being in the world. Uh, he calls it a different style of thinking and writing, style as a method of seeing and understanding things. One of the moments at which, when I was researching the Sir book, the, the penny really dropped for me, one of those aha moments where, where one feels one's beginning to understand a thinker, uh, was when I came across this quote uh, from uh, the, the series of conversations with Bruno Latour that, that he published and that's been translated into English. He said, my goal is not above all to be right, but rather to produce a global intuition, profound and sensible. And, and as far as I can tell, and, and as I argue in the book, I think this is absolutely crucial to understanding Serre's project. Um, it's crucial for all his texts, but particularly acute, I think, in those evocative poetic books like Biogier or Le Parasite, uh, where he's not primarily communicating to us information to download into our brains, but he's offering us a way of inhabiting the world a set of textual and corporeal sensitivities and resonances that, that predispose us to certain attitudes and inclinations. I've got to share this with you. I found this yesterday. Uh, the uh, Wikipedia entry uh, for Michel Serre uh, says that he was a French philosopher, sort of okay so far, um, theorist and writer. Uh, his works are notable for discussing subjects like death, angels and time. Yeah, okay. They are also noted for incorporating prose. <laughs> My goodness. Uh, Molière's Monsieur Jourdain would be delighted to hear that uh, and multifaceted perspectives. So I, I think what Wikipedia is trying to get at here is that Serre has a bit of a reputation for being inaccessible, at least on first reading, in the way that he writes. He writes in a particular way. And part of what I'm trying to do in this talk is tease out the reasons why he incorporates prose into his writing. 
uh, and I'm beginning to do that with this idea of a global uh, intuition. Um, I want to try and run as, as quickly as I can through six features of this global intuition because I think they really do unlock Serre's thought and, and his démarche uh, for us. So number one, uh, intuition stands for Serre at the beginning of the creative process in the arts and at the beginning of the inventive process in the sciences. So again, he's not cleaving apart the arts and sciences. He's trying to think across the two of them. Uh, the uh, global intuition generates the initial hypothesis that's to be tested or the initial way of seeing the world that's to be explored. Uh, intuition, therefore, is distinct from understanding. So, for example, when we come to an understanding of the vast duration of time since the Big Bang, now we, we understand that as a concept. I know that the world has existed for a long time. We have not yet intuited it. They're different things. An intuition is... Uh, in an important sense, therefore, if you like, pre or perhaps better, infra-rational. It's not a-rational, it's not arbitrary, but it's different to being able to cognize something. Uh, indeed, new intuitions can be demanded for Sarah by new circumstances. Uh, so, for example, the development of non-Euclidean ge geometry, he argues, required us to understand and to see and to inhabit the world differently. So there, there's, there's no dichotomy between the rational and this global intuition, but they're not the same thing either. Secondly, uh, intuition for Serre is, is, as he says, profond et sensé, that I've translated as profound and sensible. Uh, sensible not in the sense of not silly, but as in the sense of that which can be sensed. Um, intuition isn't exclusively intellectual, but he says, whatever the activity you're involved in, the body remains the medium of intuition of memory, of knowing, of working, and above all, of invention. So then intuition is corporeal for Serre. Uh, it's a pre-theoretical sensitivity to what he calls the, the rhythms and sounds of existence out of which meaning and language emerge. Uh, and this corporeality then, and this pre-theoretical, pre-linguistic rhythmicality of Serzian global intuition sets it apart from other concepts that try to capture uh, the, the entirety of a way of inhabiting in the, uh, the world. We might think, for example, of the, the notion of worldview uh, that is banded about uh, not infrequently. Uh, and also Deleuze's idea of the image of thought, indifference and repetition, uh, which, though similarly global in their scope, are primarily concerned, uh, in, in case of a worldview, usually with, with concepts and ideas, and in terms of the image of thought, with reference and truth and representation, that's not what Sayer's doing. He's trying to get at how we are in the world, if you like, at a deeper level than that, at a pre-articulated, pre-syntactic level. Thirdly, uh, this intuition is, uh, does what it says on the tin, it is global. Uh, an intuition doesn't pertain to an isolated phenomenon uh, or to a particular problem. Uh, but to the nature and experience of the world as such, uh, and specifically to what must necessarily be for a particular way of inhabiting the world. So an intuition, therefore, is not something that we experience in the world, but it's a way of looking and making sense of everything that we experience in the world. It's not a, a what of experience, it is the how of experience. Fourthly, uh, an intuition requires cultivation for Sarah. It's reflection, uh, requires reflection and mediation. D don't, we shouldn't get the impression from intuition that he means something that, that, that immediately springs up in one, uh, that takes no effort uh, to produce. Uh, so, for example, he urges us that in order to intuit the vast time that's elapsed since the Big Bang and its implications for our understanding of ourselves and the world, uh, quote, we have to carry out a theoretical effort as well as an existential one, trying to live and understand the context, content and stakes of this new ancientness. Um, so it is, it is infra-theoretical, but it does need to be cultivated as well. Fifthly, uh, Sir isn't seeking merely to describe this sort of intuition to us in his books, but he wants to produce it in us. Uh, and this is why, I think, this is one of the main reasons why he writes as he does, because of this idea that he wants the reader to participate 
in a global intuition rather than simply to understand it intellectually. So Sayre's texts don't represent this global intuition. This is something else I was discussing with Robert earlier in the, the entitled opinions. He, he's not there to tell us, to make all the content explicit, but to invite us, through the way he writes, as well as what he writes, to participate in a particular way of inhabiting the world. And the accent on participation also sets his global intuition, I think, apart from Foucault's epistemes in The Order of Things and the Archaeology of Knowledge and elsewhere. So whereas Foucault's démarche is avowedly descriptive, and whereas Foucault always hesitated to describe his own historical moment, the archive of, of his own uh, historical period, uh, Serre is seeking uh, to actively construct uh, a new global intuition based on recent discoveries in the sciences and newly minted philosophical theories. And sixthly, uh, Serre is not, uh, a direct quote from him, not seeking above all to be right. Now, I'm sure this is not the case here, but just in case Serre gets out uh, into less uh, erudite uh, and sensitive audiences, let it be said very clearly that Serre is not claiming that truth doesn't matter, uh, that he, truth counts for nothing for him. He is saying, rather, that being right or wrong is a status within a particular global intuition of the world. It, it's a move within a particular game, less profound and sensible than the global intuition that makes sense of it and gives it a context. So being right is a matter of verification. Uh, one measures something against an existing standard to see if it conforms or not to that standard. It, it is of great use. Uh, Ser values it highly, but it invents nothing. Intuition, by contrast, is responsible for, quote, the great inventions of thought, uh, such as Bergson's intuition that time is duration, or Galileo's intuition that the universe is written in the language of mathematics. Those are two examples that he uses. So then, so far, I've identified a couple of figures of thought in Serre's writing, and I've, I've tried to show how such figures cohere into a global intuition and, and try to sketch what such an intuition is. And that, if you like, provides a, a path, uh, Greek hodos, through Serre's work. But what I'd like to do now is, is in a sense, turn the, the light of scrutiny back on that argument and ask the broader question, to what extent can what I've been talking about furnish a method, a meta-hodos, for investigating other bodies of work and other thinkers? I think the response hangs on what we understand by method, how, how we take that term. If we take it to mean a set of figures of thought def defined in this very specific Sersian sense, and a global intuition with all the nuances that Serre gives it, then, then really I don't think it's transferable to other thinkers uh, at all. Uh, figures of thought and global intuitions are, are, are terms that arise organically, that are used by Serre himself to describe his thinking. And I think we would do any other thinker a disservice simply to transplant them uh, and parachute them into uh, another body of work. But I think the method is powerfully transferable if we understand it in terms of its own algorithms or figures, rather than particular outputs of those algorithms in Serre's case. In other words, the method proceeds by paying attention to the local moves made in a body of thought, which may, or I think in a very few cases, may not be similar over different texts. And then having assembled these species of figure, uh, the method explores to what extent they admit of being classified into to genera, into families, uh, with not with identicality, but with, with family resemblances between them. Now, no assumption need be made if one does this about how the local moves will or will not cohere into a global account. Uh, and indeed, all degrees of coherence, whether it coheres perfectly uh, or very imperfectly, will yield insights about the thinker one is seeking to study. Whether or not the figures cohere into a global intuition, I think the approach avoids the atomizing analysis that we sometimes find 
uh, when people discuss philosophers, of looking at particular moves that they make and treating them, dare I say it, in an umbilical way, as if that's the only thing the thinker is doing. Now, what every great philosophy offers us, perhaps, and now I'm, I'm, I'm putting my head on the block, I'm putting my head up with the perfect, I'm going to get shot at, I'm going to say it anyway. What every great philosophy offers us, perhaps, that's my one get out of jail free card, that perhaps, um, beyond its propositions and its concepts, is at bottom precisely a global intuition. Not merely a way of understanding ourselves and the world, but a way of being in the world, somatically, affectively, psychologically, and of course intellectually as well. Every great philosophy, and this is, again, perhaps why it is great, makes certain things in the world visible for us, and other things comparatively invisible. Uh, it makes certain things and certain states of affairs valuable for us, and others comparatively trivial. And says particular global intuition is, and I think this is becoming increasingly, and so also sadly painfully clear, is acutely needed uh, in our own day. And this is going to be my my final section. Says timeliness, um, tragic timeliness in many senses for us today. I want to address why I've been convinced that says thought is necessary. Uh, at our particular historical and cultural moment. And I want to do so through a contemporary and sadly growing uh, example. Uh, I live in uh, Australia, down here in fact. Uh, and it will not have escaped your notice uh, that we have been uh, experiencing some abnormal environmental events recently. Uh, indeed, in California, uh, you share this propensity to fires and the devastation uh, that they cause. Now, in addition to claiming countless lives of animals and insects, to destroying some mind-blowingly 8.4 million hectares of land, and causing one Prime Minister to have to return earlier than prom promised from his holiday in Hawaii, devastation, the fires have provoked uh, something of a national soul-searching uh, in Australia. Uh, the Australian Academy of the Humanities, in a statement issued on the 16th of January, uh, insisted, for example, that humanities and arts and cultural research, with its deep understanding of human experience and knowledge, and its detailed attention to locality, ecology and history, can make a significant contribution to the way in which communities not only rebuild in the wake of disaster, but also in equipping Australians with the skills, knowledge and confidence that they will need to deal with future crises, which are inevitable given the new challenges created by climate change. And it continues that we must resist a siloed approach to policymaking, uh, which separates the humanities, the arts and the social sciences from science and technology, and en ensure that ethical, historical and cultural perspectives inform all discussions regarding Australia's big future challenges. Uh, problems that have often been seen as purely scientific or material or environmental are now more readily understood as fundamentally social or cultural." Close quote. Well, goodness gracious me, surely now, in the light of such a statement by a national academic body, uh, we need the insights of Michel Serre more than ever. Uh, his thoughts on, on the natural world, uh, just to take one example, are penetrating, they're radical, they bring something new, to current debate, although of course he always claimed that the natural contract wasn't about ecology at all, but it was a book about law. But in a sense, even that makes my point, because Sarah is always looking at knowledge as an ocean uh, with no strict divisions between the disciplines, where, where ideas can flow from one area to another uh, without let or hindrance. Uh, he doesn't see knowledge. Um, as a series of enclosures, each with their own proprietor beating the bounds to make sure that nobody trespasses on their territory. In the spirit of a quotation from Rousseau's second discourse that Serre is very fond of rewriting, uh, one might rewrite it once more in the following way. 
uh, the first scholar to whom, having enclosed a complex problem, it occurred to say, this is mine, and found people sufficiently simple to believe him, was the true founder of modern academia. It is a model that Michel Serre strives might and may to overcome. Because his own radically cross-disciplinary approach and his determination to set all local questions within a global context of sometimes surprising and even scandalizing juxtapositions. We can think, for example, of the moment where he says that we must learn to live with cancer as a symbiote rather than seeking um, to uh, eradicate it. These, these shocking moments uh, in Serre's work uh, provide a blueprint, I think, for navigating today's complex multinational problems that, that refuse to be cloistered within any disciplinary boundaries. It is ironic, Sarah argues, that at the very moment when we need integration, we seem to have only philosophies of difference and analysis. And the problem's not limited to philosophy, however. Corporations and government departments are still divided into ministries uh, and areas which are made, consciously or not, often to compete with each other, to compete against each other. Uh, whereas Sir says any question whatever today touches on the connected whole of their specialities. Uh, he's fond of reminding us that the United Nations is not a global body, uh, but an international body. Uh, the difference being that in an international body, each nation represents its own interests and competes against the others for the resources that they share. So then problems such as climate change, uh, or indeed uh, poverty and unemployment are two of Sayre's other examples, uh, are what he calls transversal or delocalized or elsewhere a total social fact. In other words, they cut across disciplines, governments, private organizations and corporations. They need all of these to work together if they're going to be addressed. And such problems, he argues, are discovered at the intersection of a growing multiplicity of approaches. There's no one academic discourse that can do justice to any of these problems by itself. We don't need tactics, Sarah argues. We need global strategies and what, what he calls a general mobilization, uh, part of which is inhabiting an appropriate global intuition for, for holding oneself in the world in a particular way that allows problems. Uh, solutions to these problems to emerge. Such problems don't call for a facile eclecticism uh, of the sort that commonly masquerades under the infinitely malleable banner of interdisciplinarity. Uh, I don't know if it's a buzzword here, but it certainly is back home. Uh, everybody wants us to be interdisciplinary, but nobody quite knows what it means or how to recognize it when it does happen. Uh, but what he wants is an approach that, while ranging over disciplines, of course, from mathematics, uh, to the hard sciences, to literature and visual art, can nevertheless e allow each paradigm to speak its own language and to follow its own path, uh, while still moving between them in non-arbitrary ways that cohere, if not into a philosophical system, then at least into a cross-disciplinary synthesis. So what says thought offers us, and, and I'll finish with this, is precisely the complementarity of the disparate and the coherent, the variant and the invariant, and the same and the different, that today's transversal problems demand of us. Uh, we're seeking, we are seeing, he argues, the birth of what he calls, in, using one of his favourite prefixes, pantology, the practice of totalities. Uh, and this is precisely, I think, where his global intuition and his figures of thought prepare us to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We uh, have some time for our discussion. And we'll start with colleague Zeb Gumbrecht. So thank you very much. That was really compelling and beautiful. And I, I found it interesting, I mean, that you had never met him. I mean, we met him quite a lot in this very space, in this very room. Uh, this is normally the time of Roberts and my philosophical reading group where he participated a couple of times. I remember I was for the first time really knocked out and surprised when he actually talked about Leibniz in <laughs> the philosophical reading group. So it was interesting. Um, and my, my question, I mean, this is not really questions, I mean, it's an invitation to continue the conversation, I go. Um, 
they they come in a way from memories and, and intuitions in a different sense about him and his work that are not counter to yours, but but let's say you know maybe had you known him, yeah. it wouldn't have come together so beautifully. That's not a critique of this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, the first one is a real. That that's a question to you because I think the the I mean. Uh, Honestly, this is not shitty politeness or like interdisciplinarity. We completely share this. This word should be prohibited for a hundred years. You know, one year of jail if you ever use it. The most banal internationalist is hard and almost as banal. But anyway, um, about figures. Yeah. So I think it's very, very beautiful what you did them. Now, if you see Sayer's work, um, in the first place, uh, how are figures different, f uh, the, the concept of figures that you were using, that he's using, different from a concept of form? I mean, it's clearly different. Form is more general. But, but what makes figures specific as compared to, to forms? And um, mm. is there a finitude to figures? In the sense, I mean, are figures part of a morphology that is close, not in a negative sense, but in a morphology, like with card games or something like that? So you have a number of figures. Is there a systematicity to them? And that's a real question. And whatever you answer, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I'm just interested. And I think this was the way you elaborated that. That I think in him more occasional remark about figures. He uses that a lot to make it, in a way, a matrix of his work. I found really impressive. So that's the first question. Uh, the second one, and that has a certain background. Um, uh, of my own experience with, with Michel. So, I mean, different from my, my, my fantastic friend Robert, and I mean it, <laughs> uh, who I think Robert will not be annoyed, I mean, for whom Michel in a certain way was an intellectual father figure. I mean, in the sense, like in Germany, you have this doctor father and so forth, in a positive way. I mean, at the end, not, and they were eye to eye, but nevertheless, I mean, there was something very important for him. I say I was, without any doubt, very important for Robert, not just as an admired colleague. Um, you know, I felt personally always a disapproval, and that doesn't matter. I mean, I admired him nevertheless, and I think we got along well at the end. But that is the background of me saying, <laughs> I didn't experience him as, as open and tolerant as the definition of the global intuition and the saying, oh, you know, I just want to, um, I just want to think, to get things going may have sounded. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have seen scenes, Robert and I were at the induction of our other colleague, uh, Michel Sayer. We were a rec world record-breaking institution. We were the only institution, academic institution, outside France that had an academician, and all of a sudden we had two. <laughs> you know, we had Michel, and then Michel was hosting René. René into the academy, and Robert and I were there as, I think, we were Laura. official. Mm -hmm. And Laura? Oh, yeah. I mean, whatever, we were there, but it was beautiful. There, um, uh, I thought the... Um, I mean, they were close friends, and when Michel was here, he was staying at, at René's house. But that, uh, op I mean, that, that welcome, that, that talk on Michel Serre at the French Academy had a you generosity that, that I found boundless, was absolutely... You on René. On René, so yeah. was a general, had a generosity mm -hmm. that I found absolutely beautiful and boundless and fantastic. But, well, okay, so I, mean, I also don't have any bad memories, but do you really believe that? Or one could even generalize the question is, I mean, lots of people say, oh, you know, I just want to give impulses and I don't care what happens to it. But, but yeah. don't you think that there are symptoms for a greater, not will to power in the Nietzschean sense, that's too dear a concept to me, but the will of control? Yeah. I mean, okay, that's the second question. Um, <laughs> I'm writing him down. The next two questions are ten seconds. Uh, uh, <laughs> Number the, three. Uh, third one is about your conclusion. Uh, now this is in favor of Michelle. I felt. Um, I mean, this was very, very interesting with the Australian situation. I like that. That's what Gadam would have called an application in a good sense. But I found it a little bit altogether superficial. I mean, 
your talk was better than that, I thought. Because, I mean, it's not just about eco-politics. I think, for me, this insistence on somebody on incorporating thought, you know, which I think mm -hmm. is the profound reason for him not separating the sciences and the humanities, that is something, that may be the global intuition, the present day situation in which the dominant way of existence is a fusion of software and, 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 and consciousness. We completely non, -in I mean, our lives are non incorporated, even formally proletarian lives. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, this more for you to play with, uh, as you didn't mention it, and I was the one thing that endeared him infinitely to me and made me almost kind of desiring he would love me more was that he was such a sports fan. Yes. Such a rugby fan. Yes. Yeah? I mean, now it's no longer a question, but because you have answered it in a way, that was this underlying concept of embodiment. Same with something that uh, he, um, um, I remember that, Robert, when he got inducted into the French Academy, we also had a celebratory event with him. And he insisted all the time that the way that when he was introducing himself to the other members of the Academy before he got elected, he was always insisting that he was a former Navy officer. And he was very proud to be one of the Académiciens avec une histoire de Marie. Yeah, and that, but, but that's more a commentary, it's not really a question. But I think because it goes well mm. with your image, and sorry for being so nice. Not at all, thank you. The fault is all yours because it was such a fabulous talk. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for those, those rich questions. I will, I'll try my very best to do them justice. Um, I, I'm not sure how far I'll get. So, so the first one... With, with some time left over for others. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, quick fire. Um, the first one related to, to figures being different from form. Absolutely, yes. Uh, if one wanted to talk about Sarah's hylomorphic, that would be closer. But I think even the distinction between form and matter already begins to betray what he's doing. And, and you, you, you put your finger exactly on why figures are not forms, because they are necessarily incarnate, whether in, in, in a literary sense or whether in a material sense. And, and again, for him, that's not an absolute dichotomy either. Um, there's a sense of does what, what what I got from the second part of your first question was does Michel Serre ever dislike anyone or, 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 or set himself up against a position or is it just sort of free love to everybody um, he he's he most certainly does I was trying to find one moment where he absolutely rips into someone I can't remember that but um, he does talk about Descartes quite a lot in the Leibniz book uh, and Descartes' method of analysis as being inimical to his own Leibnizian approach of federation. So, in, in a sense, necessarily, if one says that we should always be looking for, for links between things, we should always be looking to federate, anyone who says, no, we're not, we should always be looking to divide and analyse, will de facto be an antagonist. And, and indeed they are, and he's not, he's not afraid to, to call them out explicitly in some of the early works, the Leibniz thesis, for example, which you know, obeys the generic um, uh, modalities of a, of a, of a thesis. You know, he has to do that. And then later on, much more implicitly. Um, so I think he, he calls out Meloponti at one point on a story about an apple tree, but he never mentions his name. So you, you've got to be able to read the li uh, between the lines later on uh, to see who he's talking about. The second question, um, uh, 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 referred to this idea of, of, of his uh, antagonists, and, and uh, I think I've answered that. Yes, he's the, the, the method of analysis, of critique, of suspicion as well. Uh, he had no time for the hermeneutics of suspicion. He said, everybody is a referee on the pitch and no one is playing the game. Everyone wants to call out everyone else for doing something wrong and nobody's actually doing anything. Nobody's inventing anything. So, you know, and he can go in hard in those passages. He, he doesn't hold back. He doesn't often mention names, but, but you know, it, one doesn't have to work too hard to know who he's talking about. So yes, he can, he can go for the jugular. Uh, the, the third question was that it was superficial to talk about Australia uh, in relation to eco-politics. I, no, I think... Not, not to talk about it, but is it more... It, I think it, the, the, the timeliness is more than eco-politics, that's what I want. Sure. And I, I think what... what not wanting to disagree with that, I would want to, to, to go a level deeper and say what, the, what Sarah is bringing to that discussion that is not usually encapsulated in the idea of eco-politics is this very idea of a global intuition. So, so what, is, 
what is at stake in these debates and, and not simply political policies. It's not whether we do A or B. The, the problem in, look, this is a, a whole different talk. Um, I'll, I'll have to come back and give another. But the whole problem is us. It, it's the way that we intuit the world, the, the way that we've been enculturated into certain ways of inhabiting reality, seeing things as, as resources to be to be possessed and exploited, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and none of this this political language really gets to that level. And so what what Sarah is bringing is an intervention that that cuts in. At, at the level of that, that fundamental question, which is it's our orientation to the world that's at stake. And as long as it's us making these political decisions, uh, we, we're against, in a sense, swimming against the tide of our own global intuition. So we need to intervene at the level of global intuition. And I think that's what he does. Fourth point, sports. Um, yes. yes, wonderfully. Yes. Um, absolutely. And, and that would fit into this idea of figures as well, that, that the sense of certain regular gestures that are performed with meaning in a given context in an in incorporated way. I think that would fit very nicely with this idea of figures. Yeah. Thank you. Well, then I'll, t I'll take advantage of if there's some hesitation. Uh, Laura Whitman and I, my colleague Laura here, Hi. we taught a course last spring on symbolism, right? And it struck me that early on in your presentation, you talked about also bringing the general together with the individual, mm -hmm. and then you had this idea of, of intuition and profound and sensé or sensible. I think sensé is a word that Rimbaud uses, maybe even the lettre du voyant when he speaks about un dérèglement prolongé, sensé. Anyway, and this whole idea of, of product being productive rather than um, right. No? It seems to me that maybe what you're calling a figure of thought could be also associated, not subsumed, but associated with the um, 19th century symbol, symbolism. What is a symbol? It's that which, to begin with, Throws does together. the concept always falls short, or it's always downstream. <coughs> If you think of how mm. Coleridge defined, uh, or Goethe even defines a symbol, it's a, I, the difference between the concept and what he called the idea. The idea is that which sees the thing and maybe is more adequate to understand. Un you never understand a symbol. What you do is that the symbol uh, just is intended to transform your very way of being in the world. So it sounds mm. like there mm. would be a great deal in the... Um, in this movement called symbolism that would be retrievable in the context of your uh, thinking about figures in, mm. in his uh, thought. Yes, and I, I think you're right. Um, for, for the sake of trying to push it on a stage, let, let, let me try and suggest perhaps a couple of ways in which, and you'll be able, knowing more about symbolism than I do, to, to tell me whether this is, is a genuine difference between his figures and symbols or not. But uh, would, would the symbolists say, for example, that phenomena in the natural world are symbols, like that the daisy in one's garden is a symbol, oh, yeah. for example? Oh, sure. mm -hmm. Okay. Especially. Excellent. Yeah, especially phenomena, yeah. rather than literary uh, uh, invented characters or, or gods. And would that be the daisy as an idea, or would it be this daisy? Well, it, okay, so Coleridge is not the most compelling definition of, of symbolism, but imagine that when Coleridge says that in the symbol, the general, uh, there's a translucence of the general in the individual and of the... Um, or the special in the individual and the general in the in, in the special, and therefore this translucence is something that never leaves the phenomenon, which is the symbol. But the the phenomenon, the daisy, becomes symbolic when it incorporates this translucence of going from the individual to the special to the general, mm -hmm. and eventually to the universal. Mm -hmm. Concepts cannot follow this uh, this kind of revelation. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you could, I, I don't want to say that Michel was a symbolic writer. He, yeah. he should have been a poet if he wanted to be a symbolist. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think he understood even intuitively, if not, um, you know, through study that mm -hmm. 
if if you don't per, if you don't bring to bear the the kind of opacity that s symbols traditionally have, then your thought can be exhausted. Your thought can be consumed, i.e., translated into concepts. And I, you know, we know Michel well enough to know that any attempt to translate his thinking into uh, mere concepts was anathema to him, um, because he felt that then it would no longer. He would no longer. It would no longer be under the auspices of Hermes, mm -hmm. the god of communication, who um, is always the, the the messenger, and the message always being beyond uh, the hermeneutic effort to mm. um, stabilize its meaning. Yeah. Well, it it seems as as you describe it very close as as you indicate yourself to to what Sarah is doing. I wonder if one did want to try and get a cigarette paper between him. And uh, uh, and symbolism, uh, whether w whether one could do it this way, that for Sir the generality, if we take the example of the daisy, is a way of disposing space and rhythming time. So what the daisy does is it, it if you like, it performs a spatio-temporal gesture that is recognisable across other instances of daisiness. Um, and, and that is the generality. So we have one more uh, question, I think, and then we can wrap up. So, well, just your, briefly, your uh, so Hermes is a symbol or character, you said, brings on the New Age 
not only thinking of, but producing the, pan, the pantology. Um, and I was just wondering, like, w there's forces that are counter to that hermetic production of, glo of global pantology. I wonder what the name is for that in the pantheon of Greek gods. Uh, does anybody know off the top of their head? Who would, who would it be who, who thinks that Hermes is something to be countered? Well, Sir Excessive communication. <laughs> excessive communication. Um, Sir says that, that Hermes supervenes on um, uh, an age of, of Prometheus. So it's the age of production that is superseded by the age of communication. Um, I think you're asking what comes after yeah. Yeah. Hermes. Well, interestingly, the, you can get at that from a Cersean point of view. So he, he uses Hermes in, in this, this series of five books uh, from the, the 70s and early 80s. Hermes sort of drops out and he begins talking much more about angels immediately after Hermes, which, which is a pluralizing of the instance of communication. So the, the, the thing about Hermes that I, I think he, he draws away from is that there's one of him. Uh, whereas uh, with angels, there's, there's a plurality of um, uh, ways of, of taking information from one place to another. And, and in a sense, I think that that does substantially bring us up to the present moment in the way that, that at least theoretically, um, and, and other people in the room may well know much more about this than I do, communication on the World Wide Web has been decentered. There is no central locus of control now or no central body that takes all the messages everywhere. It's a distributed mm -hmm. network. And I think the move from Hermes to angels prefigures and actually um, therefore characterizes that really, really quite nicely. And so if you're asking what comes after Hermes, I, I'd, I'd say angels. Yeah. Although that is also a little bit... This was with Michel, I always, uh, we had little mild disagreements about his optimism because he, he really did see the internet and the whole uh, digital thing as, as angelic, that it has an angelic quality. And he's right because angels are messengers and that, that he, it's beautiful to think that, that the whole system is populated by invisible angelic uh, forces of, of communication. But I think the, the real, what I would offer, Mm -hmm. That's wishful thinking, huh? It's, I don't know. I, I would offer a different uh, figure, which comes not from classical mythology, but it comes from Dante in uh, Inferno 9, when the Hermes figure comes to unblock the uh, crisis where Virgil and Dante cannot get into Inferno, the, the, the inner city of Dis, because it, the demons uh, are blocking it. And, so the, the Hermes figure unblocks it, but in the meantime, the threat is that of petrification. And th so the Medusa figure, I think, would be the other of Hermes. Mm. And what, the, what is the threat of per petrification, I think, might be implicit in, in what you were suggesting, that th he did believe that there's a, a way of thinking that could be uh, either um, you just non-sensitive to communication, mm. overly analytic, namely mm -hmm. about dividing and, mm -hmm. and différence, you know, that maybe there's a certain kind of thinking that is, has a, um, you know, a Medusa effect on, on our, our ways of being in the world, but that's just speculation. Mm -hmm. Well, especially I would group. want to know which God communicates between Hermes and Medusa. <laughs> you, you, you'll have to invent that God, Corey, I think. I don't know if he exists. They need to yeah. talk to each other, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they need that's, to talk that's to each other. Hesitation we don't have to be able to I'd like you all to welcome me in thanking uh, Christopher Walken. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thank you.